think it was minus 10 at that particular point. And I, neither one of us took our coats off at all at that point. So good. Wind was brutal. So <laughs> it's good to see you in the short sleeves today, at least. Um, one other thing, I guess, before I get too deep into the presentation, uh, Buzz mentioned about uh, cracking tests, and, and that is a very hot topic uh, in the industry right now. And um, I know I'm not here to promote other meetings necessarily, but just wanted to point out that next month, uh, the Association of Asphalt Paving Technologists is meeting in Indianapolis. And on that Sunday afternoon, we've got something that's called a leading edge workshop. We're doing something a little different this year in that it's a it's going to be a debate style format about some of the cracking tests that uh, that we're talking about. So uh, if y'all get the opportunity, you can come and visit us. That's up in Indianapolis, March 13th through the 16th, uh, and that would be great if you would love to see y'all there. I'm going to switch gears from mixture testing and talk about binder testing and specifically the implementation of the master test and specification. Uh, talk a little bit about the challenges, questions that we see that are out there. Uh, Matt mentioned that there's an appeal to you all to give us feedback uh, on things that, how are it working, uh, how's it going, what things can we change, what questions do you have. That's all very important, so I will make that appeal. If you could let me know some of the issues that you're seeing out there, that would be great, uh, because we're really trying to work through some of those issues. I'll give you a I guess just the, the disclaimer here at the beginning, I don't have any cool videos of trucks falling over on their sides or rockets blowing up or anything like that. So uh, this is just basic binder stuff that we're going to talk about. So just kind of bear with me as we go through that. Uh, first things first, thanks to the folks that really make this possible. Uh, that's, as Matt mentioned, we have a cooperative agreement with the Federal Highway Administration. You can see the big long string of, of project numbers there, so I won't for you that, but the folks we work with, uh, Mike Oreste, he's the COTR, the technical rep for our contract, uh, John Bukowski, Tom Harmon, Matt Corrigan, Jeff Withy, Tim Ashenbrenner, Jason Dietz, they've all been involved uh, with helping us on this contract, so uh, thanks to them, and of course, thanks to our member companies of the Asphalt Institute. Uh, they're the ones uh, that make it possible for me to come to meetings like this and share this information with you all, and specifically to our technical advisory committee. Uh, for the input that they've given us on this and other topics through the years. Um, if you uh, just kind of set the tone a little bit, if you look at the products that are out there as far as AASHTO products, uh, the masker test is AASHTO T350. So it used to be TP70, which was a provisional test procedure. It's now a full standard as T350. Uh, so you can find it there. There's an ASTM version uh, as well. Uh, I don't have that number here, but uh, you can find that as well. Uh, the specification is M332, uh, which always used to throw me off because the volumetric specs for mixtures was M323, so it, it can just be just a, a little bit off uh, for us to work with that. But that comes from, uh, again, uh, some of the, you know, the specification that we were looking at originally uh, in the draft form, and it's really very similar to M320 except for the masker edition. So that, that's a change in there as well. There is a draft standard practice uh, for evaluating the elastic behavior uh, of asphalt binders using the masker test, and that's using that recovery JNR uh, elastic response curve, if you want to, if you want to call it that. Uh, right now, that curve is in an appendix in M332. So I think it's appendix X1 in M332. So the curve's there. You can find that information. Uh, but it really, you know, it's not part of the spec in and of itself. Uh, so it's just kind of an add-on. And the thing is, a lot of states are using that add-on curve because they're wanting to replace their current PG plus tests like elastic recovery and some other things. So uh, it's in the appendix of the specification, but I don't know that that's really where it should be as far as the home goes uh, because it's not a spec in and of itself. So we've, we've pulled it out as a draft standard practice and, and put it together that way. And so that's been sent to AASHTO. Uh, 
uh, subcommittee on materials for their review. Uh, I think Matt has kept that over for them. So uh, what are some of the challenges that we're seeing out there and some of the questions that, that we've been receiving on MASKER? And I'm going to touch on each of these issues a little bit. There may be others. We'd love to hear from you so that we can kind of understand where we are in the whole process. Uh, one of the biggest ones that we're running into is inconsistent implementation uh, by specifying agencies. So uh, if you think back to the days before SHARP, uh, and the superpaid binder specification. One of the intents of the superpaid binder specification was to get rid of grade proliferation, if I can say that right, um, because there were uh, all different types of tests that are out there, and I know John mentioned this in the workshop on Tuesday. Uh, the tests were developed by people that said, my product looks good in this test, so if you want to specify my product, you should specify this test. And that's how you ended up with different tests and different procedures that are out there and why we have elastic recovery procedures that are all different. Uh, you know, there's a standard, but people modify that standard. And so all those things have changed and you end up with grade proliferation. And so what, that's one of the things that the PG binder spec was supposed to address is to kind of bring it all back in. Didn't really happen perfectly that way because there were some gaps in the spec. And so we had to bring it back and say, well, how can we fix that? And that's really where MASKER is coming in as to how we can address some of those issues. Grade names are important, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it was a big transition for states to go from the AC system and the AR system to the PG system. And now we're talking about adding letters to that PG system. And so that is an issue as well. Variability of the masker test, we'll talk some more about that. The selection of appropriate test temperatures. Uh, leadership champion, in other words, just having folks that are leading this effort uh, and going out there. The use of the recovery JNR curve for evaluating elastic uh, response, there's a lot of questions on that. Um, the use and relevance of the JNR diff uh, parameter as a specification requirement, and that's the stress sensitivity parameter. The use and criterion of the intermediate temperature binder parameter, G star times sine delta. It's not specifically related to MASKER, but it is still an M332. And the criterion for unmodified asphalt binders are S grades. I know it's not as much interest to this group, but, but it's still a concern if we're going to get everything into one spec. And then finally, uh, the original DSR criteria and then quick QC testing on that original binder. So. Um, I mentioned this, I, I presented some of this information at the ETG meeting uh, this past September. Uh, and Bob Klutz was kind enough to give me some info on where they were at the time with the ASTM standard and some of the negatives uh, that they had from the specification. And he provided a summary of some key points, so I'm going to try and summarize there uh, now. Um, there was some confusion on the language uh, that was in the spec that folks believed that it meant it should be modified. That, that's been reworded, so nothing uh, major there. We talked about grade proliferation, uh, still a concern about that. Uh, and folks are wanting to know how states are implementing it. Uh, what they don't want to see are, uh, well, I got to have how many tanks, you know, at my, at my refinery or at my plant to hold how many grades? And, uh, we don't want to get into that question at all. Uh, AASHTO T350 and, and D7405 were different, but they've since been fixed. Uh, there is uh, some unhappiness still uh, with the G-STAR uh, time sign delta criterion of 5,000 uh, for S grades and 6,000 for other grades, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, of course, the recovery JNR curve, there was still uh, a lot of confusion in there and implication from the language that the figure was a yes no determination. So that data would be <coughs> they're specifying something in this range here, and that means they're, they're looking at values right down in this range for their 76 minus 22s. So they've done that study, and part of the reason is they want to continue to get the products that they've been getting. So they've simply specified that minimum recovery value. Uh, kind of going forward from there. It's worth noting, many of y'all know this, if you played around with a masker at all, that oftentimes the recovery value is the determining factor with a modified asphalt. Um, 
So there's people that are questioning, do you even need the curve? Uh, it is a replacement for the PG plus test, we think. Uh, maximum phase angle is, a, is correlated to it, so you can see some value out of doing the maximum phase angle. Uh, this is just some blending. I've talked about this before at AMAP meetings and, and in other meetings uh, as well. We've done some blending, just playing around with uh, a 76 minus 22 and then back blending it with the 64 22 so that we reduce the amount in there. And you can see what happens as you back it off, what happens to the recovery value, but then specifically what happens on this recovery J and R curve, in which direction do you move? So here, for these values, we would be E grades. For up in here, probably we're closer to V grades. And you can see as we start to blend it back further and further, we may still be a V grade, but eventually we're going to cross that curve and reach the point that we don't have as much of an elastic response. And this is at the, I think this data point was at the 35% uh, reduction in what the 76 minus 22 was. So, as you start to drop that polymer content, that curve comes back down in this direction. That's going to catch you many times before you get to changing your grade from an E to a V. You've probably seen this curve as well. This is some work uh, that, that we did in the laboratory looking at uh, the effects of changing current products perhaps to future products in M332. Uh, and again, just kind of shows uh, what kind of responses you can get. In this case, these are two materials that were lab blended uh, that have uh, the interesting thing about this, I think, is that this particular data point here actually has a lower percent of polymer in it than this data point here. But it's how it goes together that's important. And that's why it shows up the way that it does on that curve. Otherwise, you get a response. For instance, this is a Midwest uh, 76 minus 22. Uh, this is a Midwest six, that's formulated to a 6422V, so you can see the drop that you could get there. Uh, this was a Southeast uh, 76 minus 22, uh, and then these data points represent the Northeast uh, 76 minus 22 and 6422V. So different products are going to give you different responses uh, on that curve overall. We looked at some of the NCHRP 9-10 work. Uh, this is going way back because I'm a bit of a pack rat and I kept everything uh, from that study. Uh, and we just evaluated some of the binders that were in that study. Uh, and they looked at a broad variety of modified materials. Uh, and what, what we saw, uh, and probably not surprisingly, were uh, these were the same uh, modified type but different grades of binder. So use the same modifier, different grades of binder, and they were tested at uh, the low data point is the PG temperature, and then we started backing off from there. So this is the 70 minus 34 uh, that was with a particular modifier, uh, and this is a 58 minus 40 with, the, with that same modifier, and the response curves kind of lie on top of each other. Uh, so even though the grade changes, and it shifts a little bit because we may have to, you'll see the 5840 actually starts off at a, at a higher recovery value, lower J and R at the PG temperature, perhaps it has a different level of modification in it than the 70 minus 34 is, but same product overall, and you get a similar response here. Down here, uh, there are similar products as well, and they kind of lay on top of each other uh, there. What's interesting, you can look at the elastic recovery. Uh, we, we did this for these materials. Uh, and that's what these numbers are that are showing up here. So what you're seeing, with the exception of the 52%, we've got some elastic recovery values that are pretty good uh, overall, but they're below that elastic response curve. So is that a bad thing? Not necessarily, but we always tell people when you go to compare with elastic recovery, it's not going to give you the same response. So you have to be aware of that. It, they Directionally, you tend to see uh, that they will move similarly. In other words, we would expect low uh, recovery or elastic recovery values down here below the curve. You can see that pretty routinely. Uh, if you have high values, you typically see it above the curve, but it's not a direct measurement. You're running it at two different states. You're running it at 25 degrees C for elastic recovery versus higher temperatures for mass recovery. And the way we're running the test is a little different. So 
just be aware of that when you're going to compare the two that you're not always going to get the same responses that you're looking for. One of the uh, big questions is selection of an appropriate test temperature. Uh, the standard environmental temperature, you can find that information from LTPP bind and now there's going to be a neat new way of evaluating that uh, with satellite data so uh, hopefully we'll still be able to use it and get some information there. Uh, but there's some guidance that's needed, uh, I think, within the standard, and Matt and I have talked about this, and it's probably some guidance similar to the AMPT flow number. Because what you end up having sometimes are states uh, that choose a standard temperature that is different than what the environmental temperature is. So, for instance, they'll say, well, we're going to choose a 64C or a 64.22 as our base uh, binder, even though the climate says our climate is a 58 degree climate. Uh, so you've got to get some guidance in there to folks as far as, well, what's that standard temperature that you should be testing at? How do you do that? And as an example, also, the southeastern states use 67 as their standard uh, temperature. So that's a standard grade, a, a standard unmodified grade. A lot of the modified binders are based off of that. Then there's the question with grade bumping higher traffic and where you go from there, uh, and also from grade dumping, if you're using RAP and RAS, for instance. Uh, one of the common questions we get is, uh, like for instance in Kentucky, I'm going to use RAP and RAS, uh, so instead of the 6422, I'm going to use the 5828. Do I test that 5828 at 64 since that's my environmental temperature? Uh, and if so, you know, it's not going to meet for an S grade, it's going to be, you know, too high for the JNR, so is there another grade that I should use? And our guidance generally has been that uh, for uh, those types of applications, it's you're still a purchase spec. So when you're buying a 5828 uh, standard unmodified grade, you should test it at 58, even if it's going in a 64 climate, because you're testing it for purchase or use in the wrap. And that that's some guidance that we feel like we've got to get out there to folks a little bit better. Uh, just as an example of the importance of selecting a proper test temperature, I just had a review of some work that the Pacific Coast Conference has been doing within their master task force, uh, and I talked with Bob Humer about this yesterday. Um, there were 24 samples in this recent study that they did that were identified as modified asphalts, and when they were tested at the PG grade temperature, 12 of those 24 failed the JNR uh, diff criterion and six uh, uh, and then six also failed to meet the uh, recovery JNR elastic response curve. So they, they didn't meet there. When they tested it at six degrees colder, which if it's a lightly modified material would probably be appropriate. Uh, if it's heavily modified, they could even go colder than six degrees, maybe up to 12 degrees. But when they tested it at six degrees colder, only six failed the JNR diff criterion, and only three failed to meet the recovery uh, JNR elastic response curve. And that goes back to the basic premise we've talked all about with MASCR, which is when you're testing at these unreasonably, unenvironmentally high temperatures, that the responses of the modified asphalts are a little bit different. <coughs> when you test them at temperatures where they're intended to be used at the appropriate temperatures, you get a little bit better response and a truer response. So it is important that we use the right temperature when we're doing our testing. Uh, the original DSR criterion was something that folks have mentioned uh, as a concern, and that's basically, uh, if you look at M332, the criterion is one regardless for all grades, A, S, H, B, and E. Well, if you're, if you're testing a 64V uh, at 64 degrees C, that would be what was equivalent to a 76 before. I mean, you're going to get G star over sine delta values of four or better. And so the concern was, well, <coughs> should that criterion move as well to make sure that we get proper stiffness? And uh, that's that's a question that we've received from some of the states. There was concern about the criteria for unmodified binders. Originally, it was set at 4.0. Uh, through the ETG work, uh, that was changed to 4.5. Uh, and that was based on some reports and presentations. Uh, and there was some concern that uh, that still would kick out some unmodified binders that were previously acceptable by M320. Uh, 
by that we kind of go back to this work and you notice the big number here at the bottom that from all the studies that we did and looked at that's what the average G star over sine delta would be uh, after RTFO aging if the criteria was set at 4.5 so yes there's a possibility you go from a 2.2 to a 2.26 roughly uh, that you'd be requiring an M332 it's possible if you got a binder in that small range between 2.2 and 2.26 that you would now fail where you didn't before uh, so we just have to give some guidance to folks on that <coughs> the issue of stress sensitivity or JNR diff uh, has come up is that needed uh, that was put in the spec as a way of identifying stress sensitive binders uh, it is a problem for some current formulations so as people are formulating their products now to meet various state specs they may find that they will have some issues with JNR diff it really depends on the formulation itself <coughs> it is not a problem for the majority of binders but for some it certainly is so the question comes up is it needed at all uh, again, the study we did with Pacific Coast Conference, this was an interlaboratory study. Uh, five binders that you can see up there are all modified. The one at the top level should catch your attention because the JNR diff criteria is 75%. So uh, for that top level binder, the binder A, 76 minus 28 that's been used successfully uh, out on pavements for many years, JNR diff is over 1,000%. And it's largely driven by a very low JNR value at 0.1. So there is a big difference in stress sensitivity between 0.1 and 3.2, and that gives you that very high value. Uh, but you can see the other four binders wasn't an issue at all. So when we plotted them out, you know, some of these things we think maybe it captures a little bit of information. Um, what's interesting there is that's the binder. Uh, that with a very high JNR diff, so it's close uh, to where that recovery JNR curve uh, it overall. And maybe uh, something that I thought was kind of telling in looking at the AMRL proficiency sample program and analyzing their data, uh, we, we took a look at elastic recovery versus masker recovery uh, on the y-axis for those modified binders where they had both of them done. And you can see the general trend, as I said, goes in the, in the upper direction. But we have some tail off here uh, on some binder samples. I looked a little bit further into it. And what was interesting to me was the more we tailed off, uh, the higher our JNR diff values were for those particular binders. So uh, we actually started here. JNR diff is pretty close. Then we get up to about 50%, then 160%. And you can see some tail off there. So there's something perhaps that it's capturing that it's telling us why we're getting lower masker recovery than what elastic recovery would tell us so maybe it does tell us a little bit of information we did some mixed testing this is a very small study uh, with the AMPT just to look at those two look at two binders from the PCCAS study uh, to look at JNR diff with the hypothesis being that Binder A, which had the high stress sensitivity, as I changed AMPT temperature from 54 to 58 degrees, I should see a big difference in response from flow number. And for binder C, because it did not have stress sensitivity problems, I should see sort of a normal response, if you will. Um, again, just kind of reminding you of what those values looked like. Here's what we ended up with when we did this study. Uh, and the numbers that you see here are the ratio from 54 degrees to 58 degrees. And what you see is a very similar response and ratio. So this is binder A, which said very stress sensitive. Okay. And then this is binder C, which was not stress sensitive. The values are a little different because actually binder A has a higher JNR value than binder C. But the drop as you increase temperature, which should be indicative of stress sensitive materials, didn't show this to be any more stress sensitive really than that. So I don't know that, you know, that's certainly not conclusive. It's a very small study. But it does kind of call into question about what does that JNR diff parameter mean and how do we, how do we uh, continue to evaluate it. Variability's always been a concern. Um, we, we hear that time and time again. One of the principal ones that was focused on was the Western Cooperative Task Group, their study uh, looking at variability. <coughs> I've shown this slide before, uh, but one of the things that we try to focus in on 
uh, with folks. And again, this was testing done at PG temperature and PG minus six. Um, you can see what happens as you start to test at temperatures. That's the blue here. When you're testing at temperatures that are probably more appropriate for these modified binders, that variability drops in general. So again, when you're testing it at higher temperatures or what amounts to a higher stress state, which is what's shown here in the middle, that variability is much higher. So again, can't stress enough the importance of us testing at the appropriate temperatures for these modified materials. The variability we've seen through all these studies, uh, I think uh, it, it was alluded to, I think Joe Duvall alluded to it yesterday. Uh, you can see where the values come in at. Uh, this is recovery values. These are JNR values. They're not wildly different. So all these different studies that we've, we've done, we've seen some, some good comparisons. This graph at first look looks great because it's the AMRL proficiency sample program looking at the D2S for G star divided by sine delta after RTFO aging and J and R at 3.2. Okay, little deceptive because these last three data points were actually unmodified materials. So I don't know why they asked to, to do it that way, but they did. But the good news message out of that, I guess, that I try to convey to people is that, well, for unmodified materials, I'm, I am getting variability that's pretty close. So those people that are concerned about using masker for unmodified materials, I think we're starting to see variability that's a lot closer to where it was. It has taken off quite a bit. People are doing much more testing. You can see the number of labs that participated uh, for elastic recovery that's been pretty stable. Uh, in the 100 to 150 range, but you see the number of labs participating in MASK are much, much higher. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of use out there, and I think that's a good thing as people continue to evaluate it. I'm not going to show that graph necessarily because it's too much to <laughs> kind of work through. Um, when we looked at comparing MASK or recovery to some of the PG plus tests, uh, this was the MASK or recovery single operator and multi-lab precision <coughs> from the PCCAS interlaboratory study. And these are some common, I'll say some common PG plus tests, elastic recovery, ring and ball softening point, ductility, toughness, and tenacity. We didn't have forced ductility in here. But again, you can see where mask or recovery lines out. It's, it's in the mix with being there. It's not too far off from what elastic recovery is. So uh, it's certainly within the mix. As far as data goes, we try to make sure that folks understand uh, the importance of looking at your data and just, uh, in this case, this was a study that looked at the percent recovery difference. That was originally in the standard, it's not there now, uh, so that can be a little deceptive when you see that. You can also have to look at your test data a little bit and see if it makes sense. Uh, so for instance, here, I've got, at 50, this is a particular sample, I've got at 52 degrees C, 0.14, JNR at 0.11, this is at 0.1 and 3.2, and I get a negative JNR diff. Well, you shouldn't really see this be higher than this. That's unusual. Uh, so that negative is certainly a trigger for us. The very high recovery values tell us that we're at a very low temperature. It's a stiff material. It's got a lot of elastic response to it. At 58 degrees C, we see what happens. Again, this is another indicator that perhaps uh, maybe that value is wrong or even that value is wrong. We'll have to look at it, or both of them, because you shouldn't go up in temperature and down in JNR, uh, and presumably the same sample. This direction is proper, but what you see here is because of the big difference between JNR at 3.2 and 0.1, you end up with a very high JNR dip. These are very low numbers. We don't expect that material to have an issue with rutting, and this is at its PG grade. Uh, so we wouldn't expect it to have an issue with rutting, which is why you're looking at putting a waiver into the standard for very stiff materials below, I think, I think it's looking at below 0.1, maybe even 0.25 for JNR, and again, you can see what the recovery values look like. So I encourage folks to always kind of look at the data, make sure that it makes sense overall. Use and criterion of the intermediate temperature binder parameter. The question there is uh, for the H, uh, V, and E grades, the recommendation is to increase to 6,000 instead of, instead of 5,000, which is where it's at. Uh, 
uh, should that criterion change for each grade as opposed to being one. Uh, we've, we've taken a look at some information and this is just, just kind of for, for your info. In current M320, uh, if, you, if you go from 2.2 to 5,000 at 76 and 31 degrees, you get a maximum slope of that line that you can be at. If you go uh, down to 25 degrees C, that slope gets flatter, so you're actually making it a little bit tougher on your materials by going down to that colder temperature overall. If you want to make them equivalent, you would simply extend that line out and you would say, well, this ought to be the new criterion, whatever this, this level is, because that's going to give me the same, uh, keep the same slope of the line. And so that's going to be there. That could change for the HB and E grades. So it might be something that we look at as to whether 6,000 is sufficient or whether we need to change off of those numbers. And then quick QC testing, that's always an issue out there with some terminals. They may not have an RTFO oven. Uh, they need to validate the presence of the modifier. Uh, maybe on original binder, they're looking at doing phase angle. We need some guidance in there. Uh, finally, grade names uh, in M332, those are an issue. Uh, the PG designation is still appropriate. It is still a performance grade. <coughs> uh, confusion over whether it should be E. Uh, you know, the concern is, well, if somebody asks for a V or an E uh, and you're asking over like a speaker or something, that might be a little difficult to hear. So there was a suggestion to look at an X instead of an E. I don't think that was uh, made it through. Uh, initially, there was some discussion about it, but most people felt like uh, keeping it at E. And then one of the issues we always hear about is, well, we don't have a rutting problem, so why do we need a better high temperature parameter? Uh, why do we need to do that? Uh, and then also kind of going along with that is that every M320 grade may not relate to a distinct M332 grade uh, in that you could see current polymer loading that may not be high enough to change uh, what those grades might be. Uh, just an example of what this is some, a study that Jerry Ranke did uh, with Mathy and it's one that I use when I'm showing people uh, what happens. This He did some Hamburg uh, Hamburg testing um, and did it at a consistent temperature for a Wisconsin mix. And you can see the grades here as you go from a 64S uh, to 70S to 64H to 64E uh, and, and again a 64E. So the 7622 and the 8222 are the same M332 grade. Uh, and a lot of people had concerns about that because they said, well, this is a, this is a higher grade. But when you look at it in performance, uh, when you're testing it, in this case at 64 degrees C, the performance is very similar. And that's, it's simply that we've got to a point that the material is stiff enough, modified enough at that temperature at 64 degrees C, that the performance is very similar. This, to me, justifies this more so than, than this. So for the M332 grades, yeah, you may not get a complete map over but we think that that's appropriate for M320 uh, when we're looking at rutting. We do need a leader uh, or leaders in the industry, and one of the questions was uh, that when we adopted the PG system, we had leaders everywhere, uh, from the researchers of Dr. Tom Kennedy, uh, the A001, the users, Federal Highways had an implementation technology transfer team that they had together, the lead states were out there. It was a big issue. You know, $50 million in the asphalt program, new, new binder specification, performance binder specification, big rollout, big leadership overall. Uh, we don't have those same levels of funding. We don't have that same level of uh, champions, if you will. And so we do need folks to step out there and understand that the implementation belongs to everyone. It's not just one of us. It shouldn't be just FHWA is saying to do this or uh, the Asphalt Institute supports it. It really belongs to everyone. So we, we do encourage folks uh, to look at, you know, what the message should be. The way that I view this and the way that I've tried to talk to folks about it is that what we're really looking for uh, is a PG 2.0. So a new version of the PG binder specification. The masker is just part of it. You know, it, it's a better parameter. It's truer to the concept of what we were trying to achieve in the PG system of being 
a performance-based specification and blind a method of modification. We think that that's, that's truer, that it relates better to rutting and performance that we see out there. So really, it's the next step in evolution. <coughs> um, just a couple more slides. I've got a few more, but I'm going to kind of skip through these somewhat quickly so that we can uh, not miss out on coffee out here. Um, I would encourage you to visit uh, our website. We do have a masker webpage uh, that talks about implementation status uh, for all the user producer groups. So I'll, I'll kind of talk through some of that. We have the standard disclaimer which basically says we're putting up here what we know, but it may not be exactly the, the newest and greatest. So, you know, forgive us if it's not the newest and greatest. Make sure that you talk to your state agency. Don't just rely on that. And then let us know, obviously, if there are changes to be made. The masker informa information webpage that you can find, that's on asphaltinstitute.org. Uh, and you can find information up there, all different things, whether we've got interlaboratory studies or guidance documents or whatever have you. Our first guidance document that we put out in conjunction with Federal Highways <coughs> was uh, this document that you see uh, here on the right-hand side of the screen. And I just pulled out the little excerpt from it. It kind of talks about what we, the Institute, believes, which is that the masker test represents a technical advancement over the current PG specification that will allow for better characterization of high temperature performance properties of an asphalt binder. So that's our message that's out there. We are recommending that folks move towards implementation. Uh, of masker. We understand there are some issues, but we're recommending that move towards it and, and try to work through some of the issues that are out there. Uh, we neither really encourage or discourage percent recovery, masker recovery, but if a state is using a PG plus test like elastic recovery, we think this is a good replacement uh, for it. So it's a good first step. Again, there are issues out there. If you happen to be in a state that does not have a plus specification at all, we're not saying you got to go out and adopt one, uh, but if you're in a state like Kentucky was that used elastic recovery, we want to be able to say, well, here's what masker recovery tells us. So uh, we do want to see the work being done regionally, uh, and I think Joe mentioned this. Uh, we think that'll help in keeping the, the proliferation of specs down. <coughs> Our regional engineers are spread out across the U.S. and Canada. They're aligned with the user producer groups. You can see this nice color-coded map. I won't go into details on that, but it kind of talks through where we are in the status of masker implementation. There's a database that is similar to our binder spec database for PGs that talks about masker implementation, that you can find information on the individual state, what they're doing, if they're doing JNR, if they're just doing percent recovery, what are they looking at. Um, the Northeast, uh, they actually were the first, I guess, to adopt it overall regionally. Uh, so they've moved towards the M332 grade designations. They've not fully implemented it, perhaps, uh, but they've agreed to stick with the approach. And you can see some of the, the specifics of the states that are there. Again, this was information uh, that again, may have changed slightly since, but uh, this was from uh, late last year that we had some of this information going forward. Southeast has continued to evaluate it. Virginia has done a full adoption of it. A lot of states have done uh, taking a look at masker recovery. Uh, Kentucky, South Carolina, Tennessee, for instance, have replaced their PG plus test with the masker recovery. <coughs> there are others that are considering that implementation, uh, but they've not made that step yet. There is concern about non-uniform uh, implementation in the Southeast, uh, and particularly with different JNR and masker recovery values that are being used. So uh, some concerns out there as they continue to work through this. The North Central uh, has uh, had Missouri that adopted, uh, allowed for M substitution of M332 grades uh, from M320. Uh, the Combined States uh, Binder Group, uh, which makes up kind of the Northwest segment of the, the North Central, uh, has looked at adopting, has adopted the masker recovery in place of the elastic recovery, and they're also working towards uh, full implementation. Uh, it says in 2016, I'm not sure if that's still correct or if they're uh, delayed a little bit. Rocky Mountain, um, they are still evaluating through that Western Cooperative Test Group. Uh, they've 
had concerns uh, because of, of some of the results that they've seen with variability. Uh, like with everything, uh, you do see higher variability that I think will decrease over time as people get a little bit more familiar with it. Uh, they do not have mask or adoption uh, for binders at the time, with the exception on, on microsurfacing and an emulsion spec on residue. And then the Pacific Coast, we talked about a little bit already. Um, there are states that have evaluated Nevada, uh, Nevada, I'm sorry, uh, Washington uh, is continuing to look at it for modified binders perhaps in 2017. I think, I think it said 2016, but I saw from Joe's presentation maybe 2017. They have a MASKER JNR task force that they formed, uh, a task group in mid-2014 to look at some of the issues and to try and provide some recommendations for uh, the states to consider. So they're actively evaluating it as well. Um, not sure, you know, what the process is, but, you know, we've been assisting as we can on all those things. So uh, just in summary on, on where we're at with that, we're we are, the Institute, continuing to work through the user-producer groups to encourage the adoption and implementation of the MASKER test and spec. Eventually, we would like to see that transition to M332, uh, as that's the next step in evolution, I guess, in the PG spec. Uh, there is a renewed emphasis, we think, to consistently implement it. Uh, we want to keep away from getting into uh, grade proliferations out there. So spec proliferation, we want to keep that as tight as possible. It's worth noting that where states have either partially or fully adopted it, we have not heard of major issues. Um, if you talk to some of the folks in the Northeast, some of the concerns that were out there that, that we would hear about, um, you know, we just, or that we're, expressed as possible concerns, we just haven't heard as much of those. There's always going to be a transition, and there's always going to be some issues that have to be worked through, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a stepping process. We did the same thing with the PG specification when we were transitioning. It takes time to learn how to, how to do it, what it means, how to put it all together. So uh, with that, I, I do thank you for your attention, and uh, be glad to answer any questions right before break or at break. Well, we're going to hold off. Maybe if um, you do have any questions for Mike, you can ask them at break. Um, today, we're going to move our break to just outside of the room um, instead of in the larger uh, room that we were in yesterday. So the break time will be right out here. Um, during break, we have another poll that we'll put up as to how AMAP can best help you um, promoting items, how we can best um, help communications. And so we'll put that poll up here. We'll leave that up here during break. And um, you can poll for us then. And let's try to get back here in about 10 minutes. And uh, thank you. Yep, since we've uh, just to, thanks, Mike. We, we've picked up a variety of new people today. So for those that aren't familiar, you know, we, we want you to use your phone, not uh, put it away. And if you could text, the, um, the word AMAP 101 to the phone number 22333. You'll be able to communicate with us in the poll. And the poll should be right here. I, I have your presentation.